if we disallow one of the three conditions that make deadlock possible, then that will prevent deadlock from ever occurring. So if mutual exclusion, no preemption, or hold and wait is simply not possible, then we'll never have deadlock. However, it's useful to have those features. It generally makes code more efficient and easier to write. So another way to assure that deadlock does not occur is to avoid it, which means that we do not allow a circular wait condition to arise. Though effective, this approach requires some extra information that you may not always have. Specifically, the operating system has to know what the future resource requests of each process in the system will be. Specifically, we assume we have the following information. R is a resource vector, and this tells us the total amount of each type of resource that the system has available. V is the available vector. This is the amount of each type of resource that is currently available in the system. We also require C, which is a claim matrix. The entries in this matrix indicate how much of a given resource type each process will need at some point. And lastly, we have A, which is an allocation matrix. This is the amount of each type of resource currently possessed by each process. If we have all of this information, then we can apply an algorithm called the banker's algorithm in order to determine if it's possible to run all of our processes to completion without deadlock occurring, and if so, what order we should run them in. To demonstrate this, I'll write out an example of values for each of these variables, and we'll see how the banker's algorithm can find a path to execute the processes in. I've written out the state of a system in the middle of execution. So we have three types of resources in this system. This is the resource vector R, and these could be things like units of memory, file handles, interrupt channels, a semaphore value. The point is we have three types and for resource type 1 we have six units overall, eight units of resource type 2, and seven units of resource type 3. Now this is the claim matrix C and here are four processes. So when these processes enter the system they had to state to the system in advance this is the total number of each of these resource types that I need to hold in order to complete my computation. So at some point between starting and finishing, process one will need to simultaneously hold four units of resource one, five units of resource two, and three units of resource three. It doesn't necessarily need all of this throughout the entirety of computation. It just needs to have them at some point during its computation. And we also have similar information for the other processes. Now this matrix is the allocation matrix. So this is going to constantly change as the processes execute. This information is fixed for each process that enters the system and this resource vector is simply fixed for the system. But the allocation matrix says, for example, that process one currently has two units of resource type one, two units of resource type two, and zero units of resource type three. So something that will be important in determining which process to execute first is seeing how many more units of each resource type can be claimed by a process. So this process currently has two units of resource type one, but it eventually needs four. Now, something that I haven't drawn yet is 
the available vector. So this vector V represents the units of each resource type that are currently unclaimed in the system. And we can actually compute this based off of R and A. All we do is add up all of the values in a given column here to find out how many units of that resource are currently allocated. And then we subtract that from the resource vector, which is the total amount of that resource in the system. So for resource type 1, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 units currently claimed out of a total of 6. So 6 minus 6 is 0, meaning 0 units of resource type 1 are currently available in the system. For resource 2, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 allocated units out of a total of 8. So 8 minus 5 means there are 3 units of resource type 2 left to be claimed. For 3, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units that are allocated. Out of 7, 7 minus 5 is 2. And so now we have our available vector. There are 0 units of resource type 1 available, 3 of type 2, and 2 of type 3. The next thing we need to compute is called the need matrix. The need matrix is simply the matrix C minus the matrix A. So to compute this first row, we would do 4 minus 2 is 2, 5 minus 2 is 3, and 3 minus 0 is 3. And you can fill the rest out on your own to get the following. And having computed this need matrix, we can determine whether it's possible to execute a process and avoid deadlock by comparing the rows in the need matrix to the available vector. Specifically, if the amount of each resource type that is needed for a given process is less than or equal to the corresponding available values of each resource, then that particular resource can be safely run to completion. Additionally, if we can find a way to execute all of these processes in sequence, assuming that every completed process returns its claimed resources to the system, then that means we can execute all the processes and avoid deadlock. So first we'll consider row 1 for process 1. Process 1 still needs two units of resource 1 to finish. There are zero units of resource 1 available, therefore we cannot execute process 1. It might run for a few steps if we attempted to execute it, but eventually it would attempt to claim those resources which would lead potentially to deadlock. So we're going to avoid that and consider other processes. Process 2 requires zero units of resource 1, which is good because there's none available, and requires zero units of resource 2, which is less than the three that are available, but it requires three units of resource type 3, and we do not have that many available. Therefore, it is not safe to run this process either, because when it attempts to claim that third unit of resource type 3, it will block, potentially leading to deadlock. Now row 3 only requires 0, 1, and 0 units of resource types 1, 2, and 3 respectively. And 0 is less than or equal to 0, 1 is less than or equal to 3, and 0 is less than or equal to 2. Therefore it is safe to run process 3 to completion. And you can confirm on your own that it is not safe to run process 4. So it is not always the case that there will only be one viable option, but in this particular example, the one and only option that is safe to run is process 3. So if we 
run process three to completion, then it will be eliminated from our calculations. And importantly, all of its allocated resources will be returned to the system here. So the new available vector would be 0 plus 1 is 1, 3 plus 1 is 4, and 2 plus 3 is 5. So with more resources available, we are now able to run certain processes that we did not have enough resources to safely run before. For example, it is now safe to run process 4 because 1 is less than or equal to 1 and these zeros are clearly less than 4 and 5. So we will run process 4 to completion and that will mean that its resources are reclaimed leading to the following available vector. Given this available vector and these two processes left to run, the only one that is safe to run is process 2, since 3 is less than 7 and zeros are less than these values. So let's run it to completion and reclaim its resources. And now with this available vector, we finally have enough resources to run process 1 because 2 is less than 4, 3 is less than 6, and 3 is less than 7. So we run this to completion. We add back the allocated resources to the available vector and get the following. And now the available vector equals the resource vector, which is one way of checking that you've done all your computations correctly. Naturally, because there are no processes running, no resources are allocated, so the number of units of available resource of each type should match the total available resources in the system. So the fact that we were able to carry out this process all the way to completion shows that there was a way to run these processes without causing deadlock. If we had ever had a situation where none of the rows in the need matrix had a resource need less than what was available, then that would have been a problematic situation. However, if your system is running this algorithm from the time it boots up until the time you're done running all your processes, then it will assure that such a situation never arises.